Are ghosts real? Several recent encounters suggest there might be more things in heaven and earth than we can dream of. So are werewolves just a Hollywood creation, or do half-man, half-wolf creatures really exist? Now, tonight, we kick off our Conspiracy Theory Month series, which was a... The legend of the vampire actually goes back for centuries, and it exists in some form or another in almost every culture. In fact, some people believe the first vampire story was in the Bible. Well, for decades, only crackpots and crazy people believed in UFOs. That's what I thought anyway. And then in recent years, it turns out that governments have been taking them seriously all along. Try and clear up an ancient mystery with the help of a common veterinarian who says she can prove that Bigfoot exists and that he's related to all of us. New reports by pilots coming forward over the weekend saying they've had multiple mid-air encounters with high-flying, fast-moving objects. Good evening, folks. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Celestial Oddities Pair of Normal Guys podcast. I am one of your hosts, Garrett Jagaman. And I'm your second host, Daniel James. And we're glad to have you listening in tonight. As always, if you are a return listener to the show, thank you. We appreciate your support and love. Make sure, as always, you click the like, share, and follow button. Even if you're a new listener, please do that as well. Because the more that you do that, the more that it moves us up the podcast community rankings, the more buzz that it gets the show, more people that see it and join along, and the bigger and better things that we can continue to do with it. It also keeps you in the loop with all brand new episodes as they come out and gives you straight access, direct access to all of our past episodes. And we certainly have a lot of great topics and info that we've dived into and, um, you know, certainly no different tonight. So before we jump into tonight's episode, we do bring you anywhere from two to three episodes per month, um, you know, talking over all things supernatural, paranormal, occult, metaphysical, and anything in between. So please share it around if that's something that interests you. And uh, if you have any ideas for the show, you want to hear us do something that we are not hear us do something differently and you don't like that we're doing something, whatever it might be, you feel free to email us at celestialoddities at gmail.com. We answer you daily so you don't have to worry about sitting for a long time and not getting a response back. We make sure we reach out to all fans and uh, we're just going to continue to keep bringing you great supernatural paranormal content because it's a universe and realm that um, it's endless, the things that we can talk about. So please click those share and like buttons. Uh, You can check us out anywhere online radio is hosted, whether it be our actual hosting platform, which is Spreaker, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R, or you can check us out on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, you know, anything in between. So listen where you feel most comfortable. But if you want to talk to us and interact with us during the show, you can use the instant messenger feature through our Spreaker app or through Spreaker.com. And again, that's S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R. Lastly, I want to thank our sponsors, Cryptid TV. You can check them out on YouTube and Facebook. Great underground community that brings together all different minds of the supernatural and paranormal to have a, you know, a nice place where everyone can get together and talk over what they believe and what they've experienced without ridicule and judgment. And you can meet people and network, find out about a lot of new ideas that you might not have heard of before. And it's on a chill, very friendly basis. So make sure you check them out, give them a like and follow. Much love to them for everything that they do for the show. So Daniel... So, Garrett. Lore and urban legends. Something that, uh, you know, every one of us has experienced or, you know, certainly have heard a story throughout our lives that resonates with us, that sticks with you, whether you have a local, you know, local one in your area or you heard something from across the country. Every area, every town seems to have their own urban legend and lore of things that have happened. And it's always very fascinating because most are based off of some truth, at least. Some, I'm sure, are completely fabricated, but a lot of them do have some type of backbone to them. And we're going to talk about some different ones tonight. I think that starting out, I will talk about, you know... A very popular one, which would be Charlie No Face, which is a Pittsburgh local urban legend that has grown, you know, very big over the years. And certainly a lot of Pittsburghers um, or Pittsburghese know about Charlie No Face, which is actually a very sad story. Um, You know, for those who have heard of that name or heard of the Green Man Tunnel, uh, it, it's a paranormal area around the Pittsburgh area that there is a tunnel that you could go and 
people have seen the ghostly figure of Charlie No Face. He's a gentleman with a green, opaque looking face, no features, no eyes, no nose, no lips, no mouth, just kind of a skin face um, that would walk the highways, walk the back roads, and be seen around this tunnel area. Um, and it's been talked about for years. People still say that they see him from time to time. And it's something that um, certainly has gained a lot of popularity and has been around for a very, very long time. I mean, this is not a new urban legend. But there's a lot of fact based behind this specific urban legend. And it's actually one that's kind of heartbreaking Um that you know his original name or his real name wasn't Charlie at all it was Ray Robinson um and he was a young child who had decided one day walking with his family or with his brother and sisters i believe some friends that there was this bird nest um in a tree that he wanted to get a closer look at so he climbed up the tree as you know a lot of kids have done i certainly have done it myself and unfortunately, hidden within the tree was a cable that was attached to a trolley line that used to run through there. It was still a live wire, and when he reached out to grab a hold of something to steady himself, he grabbed a hold of that, and the electric current that went through it had disfigured him greatly. It had blown off most of the features of his face, blew off one of his hands, um, but surprisingly did not kill him, and he survived. Now, just a year or two prior to that, um, another boy climbing in the same tree had grabbed that same line, and it killed him. He was alive for about two days in agony after that, but he did pass away. Why the township didn't cut that down or put signs up or do something to prevent that, I mean, that's a mystery in itself. But unfortunately, you know, a year or two later, Ray Robinson... Um, was a victim of this trolley line as well and for quite a period of his life he you know I don't want to say was kept hidden but in a way he was a lot of people that had mental illness a lot of people that were disfigured and things of that nature in the early 1900s were kind of kept hidden away in homes that were devised and built specifically for these type of people and he was one of them where they didn't keep him locked there but they did keep him kind of tucked away and, you know, over time, he he developed a lot of different hobbies. He made wallets. He made different things out of old, you know, recycled tires and things of that nature. And, and it just over time, you know, tried to keep himself busy, learn Braille. Um, but, you know, it, it started to fade after a while that he needed something else. As he became an adult, his family, who you know, obviously was a bit ashamed of him. Um, they didn't eat dinner with him. They actually made him eat dinner on his own. They They didn't want to be in a setting with him, sadly enough, which is horrible. Um, but, you know, they gave him an apartment in their garage of their home. And he started as an adult deciding to walk out at night so he didn't gain a lot of extra attention and would walk the local back roads and highways and just kind of walk around, get himself out there, go and do something to keep himself sane. Well, you know, people started seeing him along these roads and talking about him and some would stop and talk to him and things of that nature. And, and it, over time, it kind of grew a very big popularity. So, yes, there is this legend of Charlie No-Face and people talk about seeing his ghost and the green figure and the green man tunnel and all of these things. But it is one of the, you know, urban legends that certainly is based off of actual fact. And what's heartbreaking about the story, if, if his disfigurement wasn't heartbreaking enough, was you had a lot of people that knew he liked to drink, he loved baseball, he was a very, very nice guy, despite everything that happened to him, a lot of people that had met him said he was one of the kindest people that they've ever met, because despite everything that had happened to him, he didn't hold a grudge, he was very open to people, loved talking, loved hanging out, but he had... No regular features. I mean, it was a blank face. He lost all of the features of his face. He was blind. He was partially deaf. He couldn't speak, you know, properly. And there was a lot of people that went out there and would take a six pack and pick them up if they could find them and have some beers with them, talk and had a good time. And I, I respect those people. But unfortunately, as we often have seen in life, there's always the pieces of shit out there that want to harm and hurt people that are like this for absolutely no reason. So there are many accounts of people picking him up, beating the shit out of him and leaving him on the side of the road for absolutely no reason, picking him up, throwing him in the car, driving him miles away and whipping him out of the car somewhere where he wouldn't know where he's at. He's blind and partially deaf. 
um, and just a lot of horrible things that had happened to this man. And he still kept his his positivity, still kept, um, you know, his personality. But he did get a little skittish of people, and he would always apparently brace whenever he heard a car coming on those nights where he'd be walking, not knowing what was next, not knowing if it was someone who was just going to pass, if it was someone who was going to stop by and have a beer with him and and, and have a good time with him, someone who was going to stop by and abuse him or hurt him just because he was different. Um, and you know, there's certainly accounts out there of people that have met him that are still alive today that had, you know, picked him up back in the day. Um, and after his passing, which was in 1985, um, a lot of people still talked about him. So it's very interesting that he was kind of a legend before and after death. Everyone knew the story of Charlie No Face. People drove around trying to find him and that was while he was still alive. And then when he passed, people started seeing his spirit, which still supposedly haunts the Green Man Tunnel today, Um, you know, which you can go visit. Unfortunately, they kind of blocked off most of the tunnel, and they even started using the opening mouth of the tunnel to store salt and things for the winter for the local borough. And you really can't go into the tunnel anymore, but for a long time, you could go in this tunnel. And there's a lot, a lot of accounts of people seeing a, a, you know, disfigured man walking around that area of the woods and around that area of the tunnel at night. Um, So very interesting. I wanted to start with that one because it's one that holds, um, you know, near and dear to my heart as a paranormal investigator uh, from Pittsburgh, something I've heard about throughout the years as a kid growing up and, and something I got to dig a little bit deeper into than just the name Charlie No Face and the lore that I'd heard from, you know, through the grapevine of other people talking, I actually got to look back at the history of the man, um, not the, you know, the urban legend. So much love to Ray Robinson. We're sorry that those things happened to you and you had such an incredibly hard life, sir. Um, but it seems like a lot of people were touched by you. In fact, there was a, a write-up that I, I looked at that a lot of people were interviewed that had met him and a lot of them broke down and crying some because they mistreated him and they feel horrible now as they're older not knowing why they even did the things that they did to him a lot of others that met him that were friendly to him and just you know bawled their eyes out because they said that meeting him changed their life that you could meet someone who has it worse than anyone you've ever met but yet he would shake your hand he'd have a beer with you and he'd sit all night and talk to you as a friend never even meeting you before. So let that show you folks. If you meet someone that's different, someone that's got something a little strange or off about them, or they're just a little bit, you know, odd, don't automatically judge because it might be the best person you've ever met in your life. So uh, Ray, you know, thank you for being who you were. And if you are still haunting the area of the Green Man Tunnel, I hope that I can personally come across you at some point. I have been out to that location I have not yet been blessed enough to have met you, but I certainly hope that I get to. Daniel, what are your thoughts? It's an interesting story, and I think it depicts the concept of, you know, that whole, that whole, you know, getting into the, like the idea of an urban legend or a lore. That's a good story that depicts the concept and I think one thing that I want to do is hit you guys with just a basic, really quick, just a basic description of what these mean and how they differ from each other. And maybe the listeners here can think back to their childhood or, or to even the town or the cities that they live in now and see what kind of similar urban legends or lores that they also have to their own local communities. So the concept of an urban legend uh, or an urban lith, myth or an urban tale. Contemporary legend is uh, technically it's a genre of folklore comprising stories circulated as true, especially as having happened to a friend or a family member, often with the horrifying or even humorous elements attached. Uh, these legends can be entertainment, but often concern mysterious peril or troubling events such as disappearances and strange objects. They may also be confirmation of moral standards or reflect prejudices or be a way to make sense of societal anxieties. And this is also why they're so unique and subjective to smaller communities and how they spread so fast to smaller communities as well. Whereas like when it comes to an urban legend or the lore of a certain sort of like area or geography, the locality of them and everything from how they start 
to how they spread amongst the community and then how much they're believed based on what sort of evidence or personal experiences that spread. Those are all what really make up your lore and your urban legends. And the reason why I wanted to do these particular topics on tonight's episode is because they also do tend to tie into the way of like um, maybe like an echo chamber or what we've talked about on previous episodes of what we call, you know, thought forms or thought entities tend to manifest. And so it's always fascinating the way that one personal experience by, you know, the, 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 the town crazy from, you know, the 1800s hap something happened to him when he was drunk one night walking home. And, uh, now all of a sudden in 2020, there could still be a story of something strange or obscure or paranormal that happened to that guy from the 1800s. It's still present today in these small towns and local communities. And I know I'm going on a little bit of a tangent here, but I'm really fascinated by the way urban legends and lore can affect a small town. So let's look at some of these as examples. Like look at the movie It, you know, Stephen King. Uh, that That's a concept that's set in the town of Derry where there's this you know demonic villainous clown that, that manifests, what is it, every 22 years or 27 years, I think. Um, that is like haunting it's like this creepy shadow that plagues the town that some people talk about and some people don't but everybody knows about it right look at freddy krueger something terrible happened with the children and and freddy krueger and then um children were kidnapped and and missing and murdered and, and and molested and uh the whole town knows about it and some people talk about it and some people don't and it gets into that whole gray area where it's like, is it a myth? Is it just a story that somebody made up and caught traction amongst the local communities? Um, I'm just very fascinated. That's why I'm going on about this, Garrett. It's like it's it's cool. It's an interesting concept that just a story, whether it happened or whether it didn't happen and ever existed in like physical well, it, it's it's it holds a lot of weight. Um, like everybody's house and homes in a small community. It oh, there does. You go. I lost you there it for does. a quick second, but yes, it, it it holds a lot of weight. I mean, it it stays in communities and homes, as you said. It lives on. It gets passed down generation to generation. And whether there was factual information like Charlie No Face, or it's something that you can't actually find any physical, right. tangible evidence, but somehow right. thousands of people know about it. It's fascinating how it holds the weight behind it, and it gets passed generation to generation. And, you know, some of them can be explained. I mean, this one is one where, I mean, it truly was just a life happening, a horrible incident that left this man this way. And, you know, if you see someone walking down the street at nighttime who has no face, I mean, it's going to seem pretty paranormal to you, Um, you know. But obviously, it was a living man, a regular human being with thoughts and feelings. Now, right. obviously, once he passed away, if you're seeing his ghost, that is a little bit of a paranormal element there that can certainly add to the lore of it. And, and it's fascinating. I think that one's certainly kind of a unique case. But there's just a lot of different things that come to mind. I mean, another one is uh, the famous tale of the the, um, the corpse light, which is uh, in Cape Henlopen, uh, Delaware. I'm not sure if I'm saying the name of the town right. I've never been able to pronounce it correctly. Um, but there, at that time, was no lighthouse in that area. And they called a phantom light. And it crashed the ship, the Devonshireman, on Christmas of 1665 and killed more than 200 men. Mm-hmm. Allegedly, that lighthouse or that light, was a curse from the local uh, Native American tribe after British soldiers slaughtered attendees of a wedding ceremony that the Indians were holding. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's no secret to anybody in this realm of supernatural and paranormal that Native American Indians held a lot of power and spirituality and not only were capable of doing fascinating and mind-bending things with their spirituality, but... After their passing, the lands that they called home have held a lot of energy in the ground. And especially if there was bloodshed and and tragedy where, you know, they were slaughtered or killed, those lands a lot of times are cursed. So it, it doesn't strike me as completely out of the question that there could have been some sort of light that purposely shone in the night leading this ship ashore 
in the wrong way to cause them to crash and kill them as, as retribution for, you know, what they had faced and what they had suffered at the hands of the British troops. So I always found that one as kind of a fascinating tale because is it paranormal and ghosts? Is it something that was natural and it just seems paranormal? Is it alien visitation? Because a lot of times we know the light balls can certainly come from bodies of water and move around as giant orbs looking like, you know, a ghostly entity or looking like a spacecraft orb of some sort. It's hard to say what exactly this was. So they attribute it to the Native American tribes that were there. Um, but one way or another, once again, a very real thing. So it could be just urban legend, but it was based on the fact that 200 men, you know, cruised into their death ashore on the crashing ship because they were led by something in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. It is. What's you know, really fascinating um, is they actually built lighthouses on that spot afterwards, which is kind of twisted <laughs> and, and funny. But I guess I, I was looking it up, and there's actually been, I think it said five or six lighthouses since that point that have been built and through weather and through nature and things have fallen down. They've rebuilt it. But that's just kind of ironic that there was never a lighthouse there. All these men were led to their death by a, a paranormal lighthouse, and then they're like, you know what? We're going to build some lighthouses here. Um, so kind of strange. I dig it. I'm a fan of lighthouses. Lighthouses I are think dope, they all I like them. They just have an aesthetic. Like they all create a vibe, you know. Like they have a purpose, obviously, for safety. But I've always felt like they served more of like a symbolic uh, meaning as well. And I don't, don't exactly know what that means for me, but I've just always been drawn to them as symbols. Like when I see one, I, I have like this nostalgia that I don't really have an explanation for. Yeah. But I feel like maybe something in the geography and the location is close. Like something might be uh, significant or relevant to me when I see one, they almost serve as like a trigger. Like, do you ever hear like when everyone's talking about, Oh, what does it mean when I see three numbers in a row, like three thirty three or four forty four or five fifty five? What does it mean? Well, like when I see light lighthouses, I think we might have what lost you, Dan. There you are. You cut out again for some reason for a few seconds. What was your last statement? You Sorry. said you said about just, the three thirty three. Yeah, and you said after the scene the like three thirty. When someone says when they when they see a succession of numbers, they always ask what does it mean, and they always feel like it it holds some sort of significance to them. Well, when I see light towers, lighthouses, I feel the same sort of like inner voice where it's like, what does that mean? It almost feels like it's drawing me to it, like. Uh, like a message or something from spirit. I don't know why that is. It's just a symbol that's relevant to me, but I'm a big fan of light lighthouses. No, I really always liked them too. For some reason, when you see them, they just, they stand out to you and you're like, oh, look at that. You know what I mean? Like this, look at this big ass brick tower that shines a light mm -hmm. from it. I mean, it's nothing that should normally gather your attention so, so vividly, but it does. And it, I agree with you. There's something, there's a nostalgia about them that I think is captivating. Yeah. You ever seen the, um, kind of off topic, but you ever seen the, the movie The Lighthouse with uh with uh, Robert Patterson in it? Yeah, Willem Dafoe. I actually saw it in theaters the day it came out. I think it was on Halloween. And I fucking loved it, okay? I loved Very The Lighthouse. Very good movie. I, I, I got it right. I bought it on Blu-ray right when it came out, but I've watched it three, four times. I'm a huge fan of that movie, and I love uh, Robert Egg Eggers is the filmmaker who created it. He was uh, made famous by The Witch. Yep, yep, very good director. Good movie, fantastic. He's producing um, a Viking film, uh, and he was also in talks to produce a retelling of Nosferatu, which I don't think is going to manifest, but I know he's working on a Viking story as well. So. I've seen, I seen the Nosferatu as well um, in an article not too long ago, which would have been really cool. Um, but I, I, it's funny because he made The Witch, and i got to be honest with you. The Lighthouse I liked the first time. i only ever seen it once, but I loved it. The yeah. Witch, I watched twice. Now, the first okay. time I watched it, I was not a fan. Okay. And it's it's kind of strange because the second watch, I fell in love with it. So I don't know why I didn't like it the first time. But the first time I watched it, I became angered. And I'm like, this guy ruined what I thought could have been a mind-bending, occult-style movie of witches and, and Satanism and dark magic. And But then I'm like, you know, no, I think it's just a different take on it. You have to not see it from your mind, Garrett. You need to see it from... 
a different set of eyes. So I watched it again, completely open to all impression of the movie. And then um, I sat back and I'm like, you're an idiot. This was amazing. Yeah, um, it's very good. So very yeah, strong. you know, Robert Edgers is definitely an, an awesome director. So much kudos to him um, on, on the movies. And we look forward to any work he has coming up. But no, I thought that the, the Lighthouse thing was definitely a fun one. I mean, it, it's funny because, not, a, not in a funny way actually, but it, it's funny that all or most all urban legends and lore are usually based on tragedy. And that's sad. It's not just like, okay, one day, one day we seen this thing in the woods and that's just it. Usually is not that case. It's, Oh, there's a spirit light that killed 200 men. There's this man, Charlie, no face whose face was burned off, which is true. These things are true events. I mean, another one that comes to mind just off the top of my head was the Axe Villisca house in, um, in Iowa. The Axe Villisca house is a crazy true story that happened back in the early 1900s, and they never have solved it. It was uh, based on actual events, like I said, where um, a whole family, two parents, four kids, and uh, two house guests that were staying at the time, um, were bludgeoned to death in their sleep. And since then, the house has been the source of tons of paranormal investigations, tons of paranormal activity. It's been on all kinds of different TV shows. Um, my paranormal group has actually talked about maybe going there at some point and staying the night and, and investigating. Um, but it's just wild that, you know, you're talking eight people brutally murdered in their sleep, never figured out who did it, just cold case. But now there's these ghosts and it's this urban legend of all the haunting. I'm not, that, that one takes me a little away from traditional urban legends because i don't find it a far-fetched story that if eight people were brutally taken from this world that there wouldn't be some type of metaphysical residue or condensation lingering in that house i mean i think Mm -hmm. that's that's um you know kind of apparent and as someone who's has had a lot of interaction with paranormal spirits you don't need something like that to happen to certainly have something there but when you're talking any place that has had tragedy it amp- it certainly is a steroid for the paranormal, and it, it'll okay. amplify. Well, listen, Garrett, you've inspired you've inspired me to try to do something special tonight. Um, this wasn't planned, but if you and the listeners don't mind, I actually want to go ahead and play on that concept of tragedy spawning urban legends and lore. And I want to tell you guys about a short film that I, I wrote and produced that is on this very concept and this wasn't planned to talk about tonight but now that we're talking about it and you brought up the tragedy concept it's a perfect fit so if i could if i may absolutely i want to go ahead and um tell you guys about this film that i produced and it's 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 not released it actually still i still have to shoot some stuff for it even though we shot it in 2015 five years ago i'm going to finish it and release it um it's not done yet though and so i'm just going to tell you guys what the story is about as it relates to our our topic tonight, okay? Absolutely, let's hear it. All right, this is fun. So it's the legend of the Phantom Witch, okay? And my ex-partner and I, we wrote and produced this together, and uh, here's how it goes. In the late 1800s, there was a young girl who was practicing witchcraft. And she fell in love with an older man. And in the process of working on her witchcraft and getting deeper and deeper into this relationship with this man, she ended up getting her heart broken. And the older man uh, found another girl and he left her and broke her heart. Well, she decided to practice her witchcraft and cast a spell she wrote her own spell and what it was was a curse and the curse was that this man that hurt her his firstborn son would have his heart broken the same way that he had broken her heart and if anybody listening is familiar with magic and spells Oftentimes, when we when we cast a spell or we do an incantation, it can manifest, but it can also manifest in ways that we don't expect. And there can also be repercussions. 
So as she casts this spell, the dark energy behind her intention, it activated and it did it did its job. But as a result, the repercussion for her doing this 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 act was that it made her immortal. So she stopped aging. It was a byproduct of the witchcraft, of the black magic that she used, was that it it concealed her anger and her hate and her heartbreak and it made her immortal. And then the second part of the the spell was the man did have a son with the woman that he broke her heart with. And when the son grew up and became of age in his early 20s, he fell in love for the first time. And at this point, it's early 1900s. And <clears throat> the the way that the spell manifested for him was the deal was that it was he was supposed to have his heart broken to the same severity that she had her heart broken. And like I said, the Magicka doesn't always know exactly how that looks. So the way that it manifested was he fell in love and proposed to this woman. And all of a sudden, when he proposed, he turned into a dark energy, a dark manifestation of the heartbreak that that woman felt in the late 1800s who had her heart broken. The dark energy manifested in this young man and he turned into what we're calling a phantom. And the first thing that he did was the, the, the sheer dread and the sheer dark energy that this young girl felt from her heartbreak. It exists. It, 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 he is the physical manifestation of it. And his fiance came into the room just as he transformed into this dark energy and she died. She passed away from it. And then as she passed away, the phantom then shifted back into his human form to see that he had essentially taken the life of his own fiance. Oh, wow. It's, into which not only did he kill her in, in, indirectly, he was also responsible for it and had to feel the heartbreak and the tragedy of that loss. And then to seal the, the spell, to, to, to end the spell, the final act of it, the dark manifestation of the spell from the young woman, was that he too would become immortal. And live with the tragedy and the heartbreak of the loss of his beloved the same way that she is now stuck with for all of eternity as well. So this sets the stage, right? Well, I'm going to double back to the beginning. The story takes place on 2015 on Halloween night. It's a thundery, rainy evening. Not a lot of people are out trick-or-treating because it's wet out there. You know what I'm saying? You feel me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, we hear, we see a beautiful house depicted in Halloween decor. And all of a sudden, we hear a young woman say, so what do you want to do tonight? It's Halloween. Are we going to hit up a haunted house? Is anybody throwing any parties? And we cut in on on the young man and he says well it's raining out what do you want to do do you want to go trick-or-treating in the rain and uh they snicker to each other and, and we're sitting in a living room of, of awesome you know aesthetic halloween decorum if you will and so the girl says i have an idea why don't i tell you a story and he goes a story on halloween night how cliche she's like no 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 hear me out listen so she goes this is the story of the witch of all hallows eve and he's sit there he's listening he lights a cigar he's puffing on a cigar and he's he's like okay here we go with with the lore right she, she my girlfriend's got an urban legend for me she breaks out into this story she flashes back and now we're seeing the late 1800s we're seeing a young beautiful woman in a white dress who has just fallen in love with the man of her dreams who's a little bit older and we see her heart getting broken and she's telling him the story in the living room of their house on Halloween night of the Witch of All Hallows Eve, which was a local legend to the town that they're living in from the late 1800s. And as this young man in the living room is listening to her tell the story of this this local legend of the, the Witch of All Hallows Eve who had her heart broken and cursed the man for all eternity – the young man starts getting upset and he starts getting agitated. 
he's feeling nervous. And the more and more and more the story is told, he is um, emotionally distraught, to say the least, by the time that this woman is finished telling the story about how the witch of All Hallows Eve had her heart broken and she cursed the man um, that made her immortal. And the curse carried on to his firstborn son. We're now back here in the living room and the young man is doing his very best as he sits there with a cigar to compose himself and maintain his uh, emotions. He's feeling very upset. He's been very triggered by the story of this young witch. So then he says, okay, well, I have a story for you. I go sit back and relax because this is going to be a good one. And he begins the story of the Phantom. And he flashes back to the year 1920, where he tells the story of a young man who had just fallen in love and met the love of his life and proposed to this young woman. When suddenly, uh, the night of the night of the, they were to the night that he proposed, uh, he said that this young man had a spell cast on him and turned into a dark, evil energy that manifested into a cloud of smoke and uh, the the shock and the terror of what he had become had literally killed his fiance, and she died that night and nobody really knew why they said it was a heart attack but the young man knew that he had become something that he couldn't explain and that it stayed with him forever well as the story carries on in the same town it's said through the local urban legends that there is a wispy phantom a shadowy figure that has been scouring young couples to be married to find what he believes to be a witch that was responsible for the death of his fiance and that he had been looking for her for years and years and years and the local legends say that he won't stop until he finds her and that's the story of the phantom and the phantom witch so then what happens in the film is we flash back into the living room and there's nothing but pale faces and the cigar is burnt out and they're just sitting there across from each other staring at each other not knowing what to do or how to react because now we found out that this you know 20 somethings couple uh are mortal enemies because the young girl is the witch and the young man is tortured soul that was cursed and took the life of his own fiance. And as they finish up telling each other's the story, they now know as they sit across from each other at the table that he is indeed the phantom that has been looking for the witch and she is the witch that he has been looking for. And they, they are at an impasse there. They're at the crossroads where what was meant to be just be a lighthearted Halloween night of, local urban legends and lore and stories turned into the crossing of these mortal enemies that um, have, you know, unfinished business. So that is my film. It's a short film. It's about 15 minutes long. And it, like I said, it's called The Legend of the Phantom Witch because one of them is the fan- phantom. One of them is the witch. And it's it's just funny – we our favorite part our favorite aspect of the film and the story was that they didn't even know who they were to each other over time and space and local history that how important they were to each other that they were dating all this time and never even knew that they were the ones and um i won't tell you guys how it ends because the the ending of the film actually leaves open ended it's open to interpretation as we see what happens next but um that being said i felt that it was appropriate to tell the story of the legend of the phantom witch because um my partner and i at the time we were always very fascinated by the concept of urban legends and local lore and we were we were really drawn to like all of the halloween horror films that would would start you know over candlelight with jack-o'-lanterns and spooky things happening (laughs) you know cheesy music where the film starts and then it talks about the urban legend 
right? I know it's very cliche and it's a cop, it's a common trope in horror films, but that's exactly why we made the film itself was that it was supposed to play on the tropes of like urban legends and, and lore. So I, so that's the story. Um, thank you all for listening and, and Garrett, thank you for letting me share it. Oh, absolutely. Honestly, it feels good to talk about it because we shot the movie five years ago and I have every intention of finishing it and actually releasing it for free to watch like on YouTube or something. It just, the, the editing time and the, the last little bit of media that I needed to collect for the film, it just was something that fell off to the side. And, and you know, as, as we all have lives and things change and we all have jobs and things like that, I just haven't had the time or the energy to finish the film. But it does exist, and I do plan on releasing it one of these years on Halloween. <laughs> well, I think it needs to happen now that you told us the story. I think fans out there, if you're listening, you need to get on to this man and say, you know what? <laughs> get this film out because it sounds very interesting i like where you went with it and i think that brings up a very interesting concept that i've actually thought about before ironically where you know if you don't kill the ego and you don't learn to become your higher self and your light body you don't ascend you do get stuck back in here in a flesh manifestation again to reincarnate and suffer again in this world of pain as this is the testing ground for a much higher level. And I always wondered if, you know, obviously one, if, if we meet people from our past life in our new lives Mm -hmm. um, as different people, but on the opposite token, how enemies play parts in this sick, Mm -hmm. twisted game where your mortal enemy in this life, once you both die, if neither of you ascended and learned the lessons that you were supposed to, and come back, what if they make you best friends? What if they make you lovers? What if they make you um, co-workers that you have to work with this person every day? No, you wouldn't know. Your memory has been wiped clean. But how how ironic that the person you just absolutely despised might ultimately in the next life be your absolute best friend. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I, like I love that. that you did that. I love that you certainly did that with the film. I think it needs to come out. So let's uh, let's push for that, folks. Tell Dan <laughs> Thanks, that you want to see this come out. And yeah. um, Somebody I think it's a good about concept. It because you know what? Fall's coming up. I think if I really, really tried, I could probably have the movie ready by October 31st, but it would take a lot of work. So if there's any interest out there who wants to see a low-budget indie film about two star-crossed lovers who are mortal enemies, send me an email. <laughs> absolutely folks send uh, celestial oddities at gmo.com hit us up drop us a line tell Dan get off your ass and finish that film <laughs> and uh, side note folks if you are out there practicing magic please be responsible because as Dan said there's so many people I meet dealing with the occult side for those of you who don't know I'm certainly very very heavy in the occult nature and I do a lot with ritualistic magic and high forms of magic evocation and invocation and it's it's something that I take very very seriously and it's something that you should take very seriously if you dabble into it. I don't even like using the word dabble because if you're just going to dabble, don't do it. No, um, but you've got to realize when you cast a spell, whenever you do a ritual, whenever you ask for something to be given to you, there are proper ways of doing it that you are going to do it in a way that will not harm you or harm others, that the things you wish will come to manifestation, but you have to do it in the right way. Too many times I meet people in the occult side that are Oh, I've been studying the account for three months and I'm casting spells and I'm like, well, good luck to you, man, because you're going to have some crazy shit happen to you because this is not something you jump in and six months later, you're an expert. This is something that you tread this path and walk this path for years, learning the formulas, the right. recipe, the ideologies behind it, the theologies behind it, everything. You got to learn these things to then after years of study, apply practice and grow so as a quick side note i've been meeting and talking because i've been a little bit more open recently than i have in past years but this is something that i have certainly been involved with for about 15 plus years um you know performed my first demonic evocation when i was you know 19 years old so we're talking 13 14 years ago um 
and it, it worked. And from that point on, my life had changed. And I, I said, you know what, I'm not going to do this as a, a dumbass kid anymore. I'm going to take this serious. And it certainly vamped up in the last couple of years. But I noticed that since I've been more open the past year about it, finally, you know, I said, I'm not going to hide anymore. I'm going to tell people who gives a shit if they judge me. But I've had a lot of people reach out to me and they're saying, how do I do this? I've been studying for three months. You don't. That's the answer. You don't do it. You just don't. Spend years on it and then come back and I'll help you out. Now, yeah. um, talking about something I wanted to bring up tonight before the show does end is, is another great concept because obviously you have urban legends spawned from pain and true life events. You have ones that we talked about that were not only kind of haunting while the person was alive, but after they were gone, they became a paranormal element. But then there's a separate category that I noticed that is interesting as well. And in another urban legend, which, you know, kind of crosses the lines of cryptid, um, would be the green clawed beast, which was a unseen. Yeah, that's right. Unseen cryptid that was rumored to live in the Ohio river near Evansville, Indiana. Now, what's interesting about this story is the encounter with this beast was a young woman by the name of Naomi Johnson, who was swimming on the waters. They were tubing and this claw-like hand reached up out of the water and grabbed her and pulled her underwater. She was struggling. She was fighting with it. It let her go. She'd start to swim away. It would grab her again and pull her back under. It did it over and over and over again. It was like it was toying with her. Mm -hmm. And other people had seen the hand. They'd seen this creature. It was a human-like hand, but obviously it was it had claws on it. It was green. It was some type of of, you know, almost like the creature from the Black Lagoon type look. But they never seen the full body. Now, what's interesting is since that sighting of multiple people seeing this and this woman being attacked and obviously having some trauma from that, um, it has never been seen again in that area. Yeah. But yet we are looking at being, you know, 65, 70 years later. Still being talked about. It's still talked about constantly in Indiana and in other places of the country. They bring up the green clawed beast in fact when it comes to the state of indiana which is in my mind one of the most haunted paranormal states in the country um the amount of haunted locations there is just astronomical but this is one of the top stories not the place that has ghosts every night that you see and all these other things that have happened but this creature who only a hand was seen but resonated so heavily that 70 years later it's still talked about and i found that interesting so you have different sub genres of what makes up a good urban legend and lore and what's really also interesting about this specific one is on that same exact day um that in kentucky there was multiple sightings of goblins that happened mm. the exact same day in Kentucky's just below Indiana. So you have two really big encounters with some type of, of creature just states apart and on the same day. Very, very interesting. I thought that was kind of a cool one to bring up because that's different than the spawn from pain because this one wasn't other than the attack on the woman but i mean she didn't die or anything like that so this wasn't on multiple casualties or on on a bludgeoning of people within a home or anything of that nature this was just the sighting of a hand that grabbed a young woman that somehow lived on and correlated with sightings in the state below them so i found that that was kind of a cool kind of side thing as well yeah that's, that's definitely fascinating and it adds more you know, a scope of reference to what we're talking about tonight. You know, um, I'd be interested if anybody wants to share uh, what their own local legend is and what their own lore is, because like you're, if you watched, you know, TV and movies, you're going to, you're going to see stories about all kinds of stuff like this. And there has been all the way back from like the eighties, but um, on a wide scale, what you don't see are like the, the, the local, urban legends and the local lores to smaller communities like whether you live in a borough or a small county or a town or a village that they're, that they're called a lot of them just have like their own thing even if it's just sasquatch sightings or like a, a, just the haunted house on the hill that everybody knows about and all the kids are scared of and nobody goes in there you know what are yours you guys can send in what what your local legend is because a lot of times carrot like small towns on the map that you've never fucking heard of people have weirdo stories that are so interesting about like their small little like you know cottage 
that's at the corner of West Virginia or the top point of Pennsylvania that is a smaller town that you haven't really heard of, but it has a lot of like rich history about this weird thing that happened that everybody knows. So, you know, share those with us. What are the hidden hidden gems throughout the world that um, your own local community has to share? And that would be interesting for us to sort of like maybe uh, talk about on a follow up ep- episode if we can get even for maybe say four or five from the listeners that'd be fun to do a follow-up episode on tonight's episode to just share your guys' stories of what your local legend is do you know what i'm saying no i would love that creature or a cryptid or a monster or even a haunted house or you know alien sightings or maybe there's even some sort of like weird factory where people think that there's like experiments that go on like you name it i've heard it and we want to hear what your stories are. So if we can get a handful of them, we'll just do a whole follow-up episode on what your guys' stories are. Just send us as much information as you can. Like, tell us all about the history of it. You know, sightings or stories, or even if you have your own personal experience with the thing. The more information you guys can give us will help us, you know, give us like a rounded description of your story that we can share in a future episode. That's just a thought. No, I would love that. I mean, uh, drop us a line, celestial oddities at gmail.com. Tell us, you know, it's an interesting concept that Dan brought up because we do have celestial oddities odd world, our second part of this show, mm-hmm. um, where we take on phone calls from around the world. But the problem with that is, is there's only so many people out there that are willing to come on and speak verbally the experiences that they have. Now, I always give Mm -hmm. the option of using your real name or using a a made-up name. That's fine. So anybody that's ever interested, you can come on that show as well and tell us your stories. No one has to know who you are. But the problem is, is there's a lot of people who have written to me over times and written to Dan that don't want their voice on recording. They don't want to come on at all. They're just not radio type people. They don't mind telling us and you know in typing and in text what they experienced, but they don't want to put it live on the air with them talking. So this is the perfect opportunity that you can send it to us. Your identity will be kept safe. Um, just tell us in it that you want to stay anonymous. Or if you want your name mentioned, we'll be glad to mention your name as well. Um, but if you have stories of anything bizarre, please tell us. We will do a follow-up episode. So we can talk about these items and you know like i said if you want to stay secretive you can so that way the men in black don't show up and, and tell you to shut up um, <laughs> your you know, secret is safe with your us your secret is safe with us they haven't shut up at my door yet and pray to them that they don't because they won't go the way that they're thinking um, <laughs> so if you're listening out there folks and no, i'm not talking to the listeners but i'm talking to anybody out there in any higher organizations you better just stay away um but uh, that last story we told you about, if ironically enough, I just kind of mentioned as a joke, but uh, I, I didn't mention it during the story. Dan, Naomi, the, the girl that was pulled down under in the water, actually did get a visitation from her uh, at her door from an MIB telling her never to talk and report that sighting of what had happened. Now, she obviously she still did. Contact. Um, but they definitely made contact. So I don't know what it was that pulled her under because there's a lot of sightings don't that no one ever gets it. a visitation. But I would say that there was something important about this one if, if an MIB showed up uh, just on the visualization of a green hand because that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, guys, don't be shy. We'll, we'll keep you anonymous if you want. And, but we'd be happy to share your stories. Just give us as much information as you can, and I'd love to do a follow-up episode about this. Absolutely, and we got two more for you folks, and then we're going to finish up for the evening. This Hey, one, hit us. This one uh, I thought was interesting. I never heard of this one until a couple nights ago when I looked it up, and it's called The Bunny Man. And that's in Cl- uh, Cl- it's Clifton, Virginia, excuse me. Um, and it said, on Halloween many years ago, a bus of transferring asylum inmates crashed with one of the inmates escaping four years or not for not four years for years excuse me i read that wrong it's very small text um skinned half-eaten rabbits were found hanging from the trees near the bunny bridge even after the supposed culprit had died that there was the escaped convict you know, they still were seeing these sightings of these skin dead hanging rabbits from trees. Eventually, he allegedly attacked humans, too, and uh, bodies were strung up over the bridge. So um, the lore goes that this guy was known to kill bunnies and, and other people and hang them from trees and from this these, you know, bridges that were around there and skin them. I don't know what validity is to this story, but they said after his passing that there continued to be sightings of skin bunnies. So I thought that was kind of a, a strange side one um, to dive into that I'd never heard of. But apparently in Virginia, that is a very big urban legend. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
yeah, that fits the formula perfect for what what we're trying to to depict here. So yeah. And it has it has like the horror movie kind of element to it. On a Halloween night, a bus full of <laughs> one spooky evening. And exactly, it's like that. It's like the perfect iconic setting. The, there was a bus full of inmates that crashed, and one escaped. You know, it's like the perfect thing. So it, you know, it definitely has that that nostalgia to it. Now, the last one, folks. This one, probably all of you have heard, and then we'll finish up with this one. Is the Legend of the Wendigo. And, um, you know, I find that that was a a cool one to bring up because it's one of the oldest legendary monsters in the country, in the world. I mean, this goes back to the beginning of folklore and time of this 15 foot tall shape shifting creature, um, that is still seen quite often today. Um, you know, that is apparently terrifying and Mm -hmm. is very vicious and will kill you in most cases. Um, and I think that as crazy as this one would sound to a lot of people, I'm sure that all these have backing to them, like I said. You know, ghost ships, ghost lights, um, bunny men, and all this other crazy stuff, certainly. This is one I truthfully put my belief into, and the reason why is as an occult magic practitioner, things that seem like they would be completely ridiculous are real, but not real to the average person. To people who've spent a lifetime studying hard, dedicated paths, there are things that can be open that normal human beings would never be able to fathom and open. And and this sounds crazy, but becoming a werewolf, becoming a skinwalker, Skinwalkers were merely dark magic shamans um, that used their magic for dark purposes and eventually became these creatures called the Skinwalkers, which a lot of times when dingoes are are associated with Skinwalkers as being one and the same. Um, And throughout my research, I've discovered that this is actually a very big possibility. It's not something that 99.9% of the population would ever be able to obtain but from some hidden text and things that I was able to read, uh, it's certainly possible, and it has happened, and I think it very well could be still happening today, and I think it is, um, that there is a lot of knowledge, obviously, in the occult that's hidden, but then there's the truly hidden. So people say, oh, I got this book that most people don't know of. Well, that's true, but it's probably still open to the mainstream. You just have to dig a little bit. But there are ways of getting access to hidden libraries and other things that no one has access to, and that's when you get to the real good stuff. And in some of those texts, it tells the exact formulas of how to do these things. So to the Wendigo, I believe is certainly something that's possible and plausible, and I think that there are sightings out there that are accurate on that so if you ever see a creature and look up the wendigo because there's multiple variations of what it looks like but it's a 12 to 15 foot tall monster with you know antlers on it so i mean if you see something of that nature a lot of times i'm all for folks interacting if i see an alien i'm not running from it if i see a ghost a demon i have before on both accounts i don't run from it but if i see a 15 foot deer creature i'm running Sorry, I'm Ow. telling you. <laughs> we Not love sh- cryptids. We do love we cryptids. Love- we need to actually, folks, if you're listening out there, tell us what your favorite cryptids are too. So we, we'd love, because we're going to do another cryptid episode. I mean, we've done, obviously, um, episodes on different cryptids so far, and we recently did our last episode on, you know, Aquarian um you know, cryptids such as mermen and mer- mermaids, and we talked about other type of creatures that live in the water and um, have been seen. We've talked about Bigfoot and Sasquatch, um, and then we do plan on having one coming up, which is along the lines of what I just said, which is the dogman or werewolf or whatever you want to call it. And I want to wait a little bit longer on that one because I have a very nice presentation I want to do on that. Um, but you know, if you have a favorite cryptid out there, let us know. We would love to talk about it. They fascinate us. And as Dan said, it might be from a big town. It might be from a small town. And a lot of times, small towns are the best place. And one thing I wanted to mention and give a, a plug to is something Dan actually brought me on to a little while back, which is a series that was on, I wouldn't call it a series, but a multi-part documentation of um, a small town called Hellier. And mm, yep. It is an amazing documentary of cryptid 
paranormal activity in a small little town. And I think that everyone should watch it because people all the time will ask me, what's your favorite paranormal show? Who's your favorite ghost hunter? And I laugh and they always get thrown off by it. I'm like, I don't watch that shit. And they're like, you're a paranormal investigator that doesn't watch other paranormal teams and ghost hunters and, and and you don't watch Baggins and all this other stuff. And I'm like, no, nor do I have the desire to. I don't like Hollywood dramatized, improvised, faked TV. But I do support whenever I think someone is being honest and being reputable and they're sharing true knowledge, which doesn't happen often. And I feel that Hellier is a great look at paranormal, cryptid, strange activity from a group that I believe give it their all when they put this together and are genuine. So if you haven't seen this, please look it up. It's one of the best things I've seen in years. I'm not knocking the Hollywood shows out there, but you know what? You have to question how much of what you're being fed that you thrive off of, how much of that is real. I would rather see one small thing in the entire episode and know that it's genuine than to see 15 that I know that the team you know, had faked. So right. decide for yourselves what's important to you when it comes to paranormal and supernatural. But we always promise to give you the best information that Dan and I can give you, the best accounts, the best stories, our theories, our ideas, the best guests that we can find. And when it comes to the paranormal team, we're always going to give you the best evidence that we can release. So stay tuned, check us out, and we always got more on the way. Dan, do you have any closing statements for the evening? No, I just want to thank everybody for listening, and um, I would very much encourage anybody listening or who heard this episode at a later time to send in your stories and share with us. Absolutely. Like I said, once again, celestialoddities at gmail.com. Send us anything that you want to see us do, not do, any stories that you've had, anything along the paranormal supernatural. Not only can we answer your questions, but we can also give you guidance. We have more experience than you might think in these fields. Um, That's what brings us uh, such a unique show. Dan is very involved in the cryptid and alienistic side. I am very involved in the demonic and paranormal ghost side. So we know a little bit about every category of the supernatural, but we have our specialties. And when we come together, we are a full unit that can talk to you about anything. So if you're out there, you're a fan, we would love to hear from you. Drop us a line, give us a like, a share, and a follow. Get us out there more. We are far from done. We have many more episodes coming your way. And stay tuned. A couple weeks, we'll be bringing you another one. Other than that, we want to thank you folks for tuning in tonight. And thank you for checking out another episode of Celestial Oddities Pair of Normal Guys. We'll catch you next time.